you will hear two people discussing an extramural course. Fill in the information you hear on the application form below. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now, here is the conversation. Hi, Jenny. What are you doing down here? Oh, hello, Steve. Well, I'm trying to fill in this form, but I'm having a bit of a struggle as I sprained my wrist playing tennis yesterday. Don't worry. I'll do it for you. Let's have your pen. Right, fire away. Mm, let's see. I want to do the drama and theatre studies. I'd like to get the certificate. The course number is uh, 60201. No, sorry, 202. It seems to be on Thursday at 7.30. Yes, well, we don't have to put all that down. Now, I suppose we can call you Miss. Don't be funny. And spell my name right. Hmm. Well, if you'll have a name like Jenny McPherson... Let's see. It's M-A-C. No. Big M, small c, no A. Right. M-C-P-H-E-R-S-O-N. Yes, OK. And don't forget it's a capital P, Macpherson. Now, what's your address? Well, I've just moved, so it's 6 Westway Avenue, Longford. Hang on, don't go so fast. 6 Westway Avenue, where? Longford. What's next? Your phone number, daytime and evening. Well, I've only got one, as we can't have calls at school in the daytime, so put down the evening one. 605-4829. 4829, OK. And you're a teacher. How old are you? 29? Mmm, wish I were. No, 32. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Do they want my date of birth? No, don't seem to. Just age. Uh, how about educational qualifications? Well, I've got a degree in English literature and a diploma in media studies. Media studies, right. Now, have you ever done any of these extramural courses before? No, don't think so although I did do something on psychodrama once. But no, it wasn't extramural, was it? That seems to be it, except for the fee. Yes, well, that's the same for all the central courses. I think £25. I suppose I have to include it with this form. <laughs> Looks like it. Uh, do you want me to write the cheque out for you? But uh, you'll have to sign it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. Zoe goes to talk to her academic advisor. First, look at questions 11 to 14.
Listen carefully. How are you getting on, Zoe? Feeling at home yet?、Mm, well, more or less. There are still some things I need to buy, and I haven't found my way to all the facilities yet. But I really love the campus, and I've already made a few friends. Fantastic. Now let's see what we can do to get your studies off to the right start too. You're on the foundation course, so you can take up to eight modules. What we advise is that you take four modules in the first semester, and assuming everything goes well, four in the second. Have you decided which you want to take in this semester? I haven't made my mind up yet. I can't decide whether to take principles of marketing or introduction to international trade. Well, that depends on your career goal. You're planning to work in the biotechnology sector, aren't you? Uh, well, that's my present thinking, but I guess I might change my mind. Right. Well, marketing is a broad, general subject that you will find really useful in a number of careers. International trade, on the other hand, is more specific. That's fine if you're sure it's the sort of work you want to do. A lot of students start off thinking about that option because it seems glamorous, but marketing can also be an exciting career, and there's a wide choice of jobs. Maybe you ought to wait until your career ideas are a bit more definite before you go down that road. Yes, I see. I could take international trade next year, couldn't I? Sure, you could do international finance as well. So, in your first semester, you've got principles of marketing. Introduction to economics, banking, and finance, and let's see, principles of financial accounting. How do you feel about that as a package? It's okay, I think. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions fifteen to twenty. You will now listen to the second part of the talk. But I'm a bit worried about the maths. There'll be some statistics to do, won't there? Basic statistics, yes, but nothing more difficult than your last year of school maths. I know, but our maths syllabus was a bit old-fashioned. Mostly algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and stuff. Hardly any stats. Right. Well, it sounds as if you could do with the maths brush-up course. Can I arrange for you to attend just the classes on statistics, if you like? That'd be great. I didn't want to do the whole of maths again, but the stats classes would make me feel much more confident. Thanks. Hang on a minute. There's one more thing. Your English. Now you know you have to reach a satisfactory standard in English by the end of your first year to be allowed to go on to the main BSc course. Yeah. Now I'm in an English-speaking environment, and I have to speak English all the time. I'm sure I'll be all right. It certainly helps, but speaking isn't everything. You'll have to get your reading up to the standards where you can understand the books on your course reading list quickly. To get the information and ideas you need to write your essays, that means you have to develop a high level of comprehension skills. You'll never get through the course material. If you try to read the books intensively from cover to cover, that's why our language skills development program gives you a series of graded academic texts to study and answer questions on a limited time. You'll probably find it hard at first, having to work against the clock without a dictionary. How can I improve my skimming and scanning skills? Good question. For that, you'll have to do a range of specially designed exercises. Sometimes these will be from a transparency because it is often how the lecture material is presented. Sometimes I think I'll never learn all the vocabulary. English is such an enormous language. I know what you mean. English is the biggest language ever. At least three hundred and fifty thousand words. Even Winston Churchill only knew sixty thousand, so they say. But as an academic student, you can get a lot of help from the academic word list by Avril Coxhead. Of Victoria University, that's in Wellington, New Zealand. I've studied word lists, of course, but how does this one help? The academic word list is based on a survey of three and a half million words of academic text. It contains 570 families of the words most commonly found in academic texts. 
Well, that's apart from the 2,000 most useful words in English. They come in a separate list. You can see copies of both in the library. You said word families. Do you mean words that are similar? In a way, yes. It means that all the different grammatical forms of a word are listed together. So you can see the nouns, verbs, adjectives, forms with prefixes and suffixes and so forth. It'll be clearer when you look at it. Anyway, Avril Coxhead gives you really great hints about how to learn the words, so it shouldn't be too daunting. The trouble is, I tend to forget the words I learn. Well, there are two ways you can tackle that. First, always try to learn the words in a context. Either learn a whole sentence using a word, or learn a phrase that the word typically comes in. We call phrases like that collocations. That's a new one on me. Collocations. I'd better make a note of it. You do that. You can find collocations in most modern dictionaries. Anyway, as I was saying, there's a second study aid I recommend for vocabulary learning. When you get an assignment, take a sheet of paper and write four headings. Words I can use, words I can recognise but can't use, words I'm not sure of, words I don't know. Don't bother with the simple words, of course. Then go back after two weeks and look at the list again. Can you move any of the words into a better column? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two university students talking about a music course. First, look at questions 21 to 23. As you listen, answer the questions. Josie, come in. How are you? I'm good. Can I get you a coffee or anything? No, that's okay. I can't stay long, but you said you wanted to talk to me about that course I'm doing this semester. Music 103? That's right. Actually, I was a bit confused because I thought you were majoring in maths. That's right, I am. I'm doing four maths modules this year. But it's an optional course. You just choose it if you're interested. And you can do it whatever department you're in. Why? Are you thinking about doing it? Well, I'm not sure. What are the requirements? What? The course requirements. I mean, what do I need to know about music to be accepted on it? I do listen to a lot of music. Everything from hip-hop and rap to classical. And I can sing, sort of. Well, for a start, one special thing about this course is that it's distance learning. You don't actually have to be at the university to do it. And you don't have lectures. So you've got to be able to work on your own without someone telling you what to do all the time. Oh? Oh. No, that should be okay, I reckon. I'm more worried about the actual musical stuff, like... I don't know how to read music. That doesn't matter. They don't assume that. You'll learn as you go along. How's your maths? Not too bad. Right. Some of it's quite mathematical, so you really need to be strong there. But you play the violin, don't you? I don't play anything. You don't need to. What about computer skills? You're okay there? Yes, reasonably. Does that matter? Uh, yes, I'd say they're essential. Like I said, it's all distance learning, so it's computer-based. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 24 to 30.
Now listen to the second part of the discussion. What about lectures? You don't attend any. It's all online. So lots of the students aren't here in Canada at all. They're studying from home all over the world. We've got someone from my group in Jamaica and a couple from Taiwan. Oh, and some from Hong Kong as well. So how does it work? Oh, well, there's a multimedia course website on the internet where you can listen. You can listen and watch at the same time. And of course, you can do it at your own pace. So if you don't understand something, you just go back. Or if you want some more examples of the music, there are links there to things that you can listen to. There's quite a lot of theory, but it's all done through musical examples, so it's practical at the same time. Like in the last module I did, we looked at a bit of the music from the movie Star Wars, the Darth Vader theme, you know. Dum 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 dum. dum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Then we looked at a theme from Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. Do you know it? Written in the 1850s. And we could see there were all sorts of parallels between them, and that's a feature of the course. We often look at modern Hollywood themes to illustrate concepts in classical music. Hmm, it sounds really interesting. Do you have a course book? No, we don't use one. We're given a software program called Notability Light, and what it does is it presents what we write, the music we write, really clearly, and it also allows us to play back any piece of music on our computer at home. But that's not all. We can write our own music, quite complex stuff for various instruments, and the program plays it back to us. Plays the actual music. Yes, so it means that your computer is actually your own musical instrument, and we can even submit our finished pieces to our tutor by email. So you do need your own computer, obviously. Yes, with at least sixty-four megabytes of RAM. That's okay. I've got a hundred and twenty-eight. Hmm. Oh, and a CD-ROM and a sound card, of course. No problem. So, how long is the course? It's six months. There are two a year, so you could actually enroll for the next one if you wanted. It starts in January. I started last September, and I finish in February. And how many credits is it? Three. In order to pass, you've got to do six assignments. I'm just doing my fourth one now, and take a final examination. Oh, anyway, why don't you call round sometime, and I'll show you the sort of things we do. You can even listen to some of my music. That would be great. Well, thanks, Josie. Now, are you sure you don't have time for that coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk about the pitfalls and pleasures of being a postgraduate student. Look at questions thirty-two to thirty-seven. Postgraduates are about as easy to define as catching steam in a bucket. Courses can be vocational, for training, as research, as a preparation for research, or a combination of these. Also, you can choose between full-time and part-time. Increasingly, the approach to postgraduate study is becoming modular. The vast majority of postgraduates are doing short, taught courses. Many of which provide specific vocational training. Indeed, there has been a 400% increase in postgraduate numbers in Britain over the past 20 years. Current figures stand at just under 400,000.
People undertake postgraduate study for many reasons. These may be academic, intellectual challenge, development of knowledge, vocational, training for a specific career goal, or only vague, drifting into further study. It is essential that you determine the reasons you want to become a postgraduate. If you have clear goals and reasons for studying, this will enhance your learning experience and help you to remain focused and motivated throughout your course. Where you study should be based on much more than the course you want to do. For some courses, you're likely to be there for several years, and it is important that you are happy living there. Check also what type of accommodation is available and whether the institution provides any housing specifically for postgraduates. Choosing an institution and department is a difficult process. To determine quality, do not rely on the reputation of an institution, but find out what the ratings are from the most recent assessment exercises. Find out about the staff, their reputation, competence, enthusiasm and friendliness. Visit the department if possible and talk to existing postgraduates about their experience, satisfaction, comments and complaints. Be very careful to check how they feel about their supervisors. Also, check what facilities are available, both at an institutional level, for example libraries, laboratory and computing facilities, and in the department, for example study room, desk, photocopying, secretarial support, etc. Everyone will have their own priorities here. I am always anxious to check the computer support available and regard it as slightly more important than library access. Your working environment and the support available to you plays an essential part in making your work as a postgraduate a positive experience. Life as a postgraduate can be very different to your other experiences of education. Things that can distinguish your experience are the level of study, independence of working, intensity of the course, the demands on your time, and often the fact that you're older than the majority of students. These factors can contribute to making you feel isolated. However, there are several ways you can make sure that this is either short-lived or does not happen at all. Many student unions have postgraduate societies that organize social events and may also provide representation for postgraduates to both the student union and the institution. Departments can also help to create a sense of identity and community and often have discussion groups available. Don't be afraid to talk to staff about any difficulties you might be having. Of course universities provide counseling services but we have found that the best advice comes from talking to other postgraduates who may have faced similar difficulties. Look at questions 38 to 40. Financial planning is essential since the government excludes postgraduates from student loans and it can be difficult to maintain your student status with banks. This has implications for free banking and overdraft facilities. Do not underestimate your living costs including food, accommodation and travel and be careful not to budget for everything except a social life. Funding a course is one of the most challenging things people face when considering postgraduate study. Most postgraduate students finance themselves. They pay often very large fees to the institution and receive no maintenance income to support their study. Make sure you know exactly what your costs will be. Institutions often hide extra fees, like laboratory costs, behind the headline fee rate advertised. Funding can come from various sources research councils, charities, trust funds, institutional scholarships, local education authorities and professional bodies and organizations all offer various levels of funding. 
As I said before, the government excludes postgraduates from student loans, so it is essential you look to other sources. Career development loans are available from high street banks. The best advice on funding is to be proactive, persistent and patient. The postgraduate community in Britain is multinational, has a wide range of experience of life and work and an exciting mix of goals, both career and academic. Being a postgraduate student should be a productive and fulfilling thing to do and you will become part of a diverse and motivated social group. That is the end of part four.